What's going on guys? Welcome back to the channel. My name is Matt Pinello with Matt Bangswood and today we're going to go over the basics of wall framing. We're going to touch base on everything from bottom plate to top plate, everything in between. You guys will know the names for all these pieces that go into a wall. Not only that, you'll know what they do and why they're there. If you're new here, hit that subscribe button down below. Let's make it happen. So I wanna make something clear before we get this video started. Everything we're about to talk about has five to 10 different names throughout the building industry. It changes wherever you're at. So please don't blow me up in the comments saying that what I called it is incorrect because there is a ton of different names. Whatever your boss calls it, or whatever you decide you wanna call it, that's what it is. So we're gonna start down here at the bottom. The very, very lowest piece of a wall is called a bottom plate or a mud sill. The purpose of this plate is to anchor the wall down. As you can see, we have small bolts like this that are embedded into the concrete. They look something like that right up there. We drill a hole through our mud sill when we're plating for where that anchor bolt goes, and then we tighten down that anchor bolt and it fastens this wall to the concrete. Now, since this plate is touching concrete, you can see that it's directly on concrete. It has to be a treated piece of lumber. The mud sill is a borate treated piece of material also known as pressure treated. The reason it's known as pressure treated is the process that it actually takes to treat the lumber. It goes into a chamber and pressure and vacuums do their thing to pull all the chemicals through the material. Our material here is treated all the way through. You might also be able to tell that it's pressure treated by the little slits all the way down the material. This is done to where the chemicals can seep down into the material when they're pressurizing it. Now a few things about the bottom plate. The chemicals that it's treated with don't allow it to absorb water. If you guys didn't know, concrete is porous, therefore it absorbs water. You don't want this plate to because it'll just let water go right up this wall. Now they say, I'm not sure how true this is, that the chemicals in pressure treated cause the digestive tract of any insects to basically starve themselves. Therefore they don't wanna eat this stuff. And I haven't seen all that much pressure treated that's been chewed through, but I have seen it. So I don't know how true that last statement was. Now the bottom plate here is also fastened to the studs here. When we frame our walls, we have the bottom plate laid out and we have the top plate laid out. We pin through the bottom plate into the studs with three and a quarter nails, 16s. And that's what holds these studs down to the bottom plate. We're gonna jump up to top plates real quick and discuss those. We have two top plates, it's double plate. We have one plate and we got two plates. We're gonna keep it simple here. I don't have any fancy name for them. The purpose of these plates is to tie walls together and a few other reasons that we'll get into in a second. This wall running this way runs five and a half over on that double top plate and that allows it to tie into this wall here. If for some reason you didn't have your plates overlapping each other, what you would have to do is run what they call an LTP4. It's a little plate to plate connector. Running them over like this is the best possible way to do it. Although I have seen guys that run all their exteriors and then their interiors just butt into it instead of overlapping that exterior wall. Million different ways to do things. We're just talking about why and where today. So the first top plate, the very first top plate up there, that plate is going to be used the same way as the bottom plate. You're gonna nail through the first top plate into the studs. After the wall is complete, you're gonna go ahead and put that second plate up there. That second plate is done for a few reasons. As mentioned, it's to tie those walls together. And the second reason is for load bearing purposes. So when we pull our layout, some of the trusses will land on top of studs. That's perfectly fine, that's great. But others, like this one here, doesn't. The reason you have those double plates up there is to prevent the top plate from sagging. If you only had a single plate, although it's only a 16 inch span, that truss and the weight of that roof could push down through that fairly easy. So you have that double plate, that beefed up plate all the way through for load bearing purposes to carry the roof. Now there are advanced framing techniques where you stack everything, but that's not seen too often here in California. And since the top plate isn't touching concrete like the bottom plate, it doesn't need to be borate treated. It can be regular old dug fur like we use for framing. The only plate that has to be treated is anything that goes up against concrete. And when it comes to framing, when you do your material takeoff, you're going to want to order longer plates. Your goal is to get the least amount of breaks as possible. You don't want 20 breaks throughout a 50 foot wall. So we'll order 16 foot or 20 foot plate for bottom and top. So now that we've discussed our top plates and our bottom plates, let's run through everything in between. So whether you're in construction or not, 99% of people understand the term stud. This is a stud right here. It runs top to bottom, full length, no breaks in it at all. Now the purpose of a stud is to construct a wall. 16 or 24 inches on center is standard, pulling from the edge, laying out all your studs. Now these studs are all laid out 16 inches on center, meaning if you hook this stud right here, 
to the next one, it works out to 16 inches. The reason you do that is because four studs works out to 48 inches. So on the exterior here, our plywood or our OSB lands and breaks on studs. That's a totally different topic though. The studs are used to carry the weight from above and push it all the way down to the bottom plate. They come in many different sizes, two by four, two by six, two by eight. Now studs come pre-cut from the lumber yard, depending on the size of the wall you've got Eight foot wall, you're gonna have 92 and a quarter as your pre-cut stud. Nine foot wall, you're gonna have 104 and a quarter. 10 foot wall, 116 and a quarter, and so on and so forth. Depending on how big you get, you might have to custom cut them. We custom cut everything for the great room in this build. So we talked about a regular stud. Now let's talk about a stud with a little bit more value. Right here we have what we call a king stud. Now a king stud goes on both sides of a window or a door opening. And the job of a king stud is to support everything going on in between it whether you have a window or a door. As you can see, you have quite a bit going on top and bottom of this window here. So those king studs help support all that. When we go through and lay out a house, start to finish all the way around, we go through and lay out all of our rough openings first. So our doors, our windows, typically they give you a center mark and then you go off both sides of that. You wanna lay out your king studs first. Once your king studs are laid out, you go through and lay out your typical 16 inch on center studs. Your king studs and all your rough openings take priority over any of the studs in this building. So you wanna go through and lay those out first. So now that we've talked about the king studs, you know that they go on both sides of the window and support what's in between. Let's talk about what's in between. So we're gonna go ahead and work our way from the top down. And since I can't reach up there, I'm gonna use this trusty arrow from over here to point to everything for you guys. So underneath our double plate, we have what we call top cripples. And as I'm stressing to you guys so much, the weight of the roof coming down onto these walls is very important. Those top cripples right there are laid out 16 on center, just like a typical stud, except for they don't run all the way through. They break on what we call the header. We used a lot of six by six headers in this house, but your structural engineer will call those out for you. Now the goal of that header right there is to take the weight from the roof above, as seen with the arrows, and push it out, evenly disperse it down to the sides, onto what we call the trimmers. If you didn't have a beefy header like that and you only had say a two by six, it would eventually cause a dip in the roof and a dip in the window. And you don't want that. Now the trimmer's job is to support the header. As I keep stressing to you guys, everything from the roof carries down to the bottom plate. So you have the weight of the roof being pushed down through the top cripples onto that header. And then the header takes it on over to the trimmer and down the trimmer. Now the only job of that trimmer is to carry the load of the header above. The trimmer comes down and lands on what we call the window sill. This is where the window is going to be placed. Now, as you can see here, we do have two sills. I get asked this quite a bit, but single sill, just having one window sill all the way across was used a lot back in 70s, 80s, 90s, and we still see it every now and then today. The purpose of having a double sill is very simple. When you go to nail on any exterior trim that you've got, you want to have enough room to get some good nails into that trim, considering you've got the flange that comes down a good bit too. By having three inches, it gives you enough beef to be able to get solid nails in. And even though this house isn't getting exterior trim, it's common practice and it's just what we do. So now the double sills here is a pretty common practice. You'll see it across all residential. So underneath this sill here that carries the window, you're going to have the same thing you have up top, top cripples, down below. We call these bottom cripples and they do the same exact thing as the top cripples. They fill in the void. They mimic 16 layout all the way through and act as studs, except for they don't run full height. They break underneath that sill. Now the job of the bottom cripples is the same as the top cripples. It takes the weight through the trimmers, down through the sill, and then all the way to the plate and disperses the weight, if any, from the sill down to the plate as well. Not only that, but when drywall comes in, they need to have a good spot to break if they land underneath this window sill. It gives them something to screw as they can't just have a three foot void underneath this window. Say you have a 36 inch window that's going in. You're going to frame that at 39 inches. Your header will cut at 39, your sills will cut at 39. And the reason for doing that is because you have your trimmers that support the header. So you'll have inch and a half on both sides. So if you take a 36 inch window and frame it at 39, by the time you put in your inch and a half trimmer on this side and over here to support the header above, you're going to end up with a 36 inch opening again. So now that we've gone over top plates, bottom plates, studs, King studs, trimmers, headers, top cripples, bottom cripples, sills. There's not much else we need to talk about. Now we're gonna go over a couple more things before closing out this video. I wanna talk about blocking. It's something we get asked about quite a bit. You'll see people do it differently depending on who the framer is. Now let's talk about why it's there before we go in depth. Blocking isn't necessarily needed. It's kind of like an extra. The purpose of blocking is to create a nice solid wall. 
the majority of the times when we get our lumber, it is wet. When we frame with it, after a while, you'll start to hear it creak and crack. It's drying out. Your studs will take big bows. They'll twist up like crazy. And what blocking does down the center here, I'll explain our heights in a second, it keeps all your studs fairly straight. As you can see, we have a small gap in between this one here. It opened up a bit. Had those blocks not been in there, it'd probably be a lot worse. So the blocks do a few things. They keep the studs nice and straight. They also help with keeping the wall nice and rigid as well. I've been asked a lot whether our blocks get in the way or not, and the short answer is no. Our blocking is set at three foot six and down and four foot six and up. The reason for this is simple. I can get behind here and nail. I can get behind here and nail and then come up here and nail here. If you do a four foot block line, you have to toenail each one of them, try and get behind there and shoot as accurately as possible. It's a pain. And then not only that, you have to deal with a block line that looks like that 90% of the time. It's just preference though, guys. So now you can see here that this box is set. This is three six and down, that's four six and up. Somewhere right in here is four foot center. So had you ran that four foot block line all the way through, you might actually not make it. They might have to cut your block out. So three six, four six works every time. We've never had a complaint. Now the next thing I wanna to talk to you guys about is drywall backing. This is an important one because a lot of framers forget it when they're framing. When you build a house, you have to put drywall up on the inside. Therefore, when you frame a house, you have to think about drywall going up as you're framing. So the way we do things, we'll knock out all of our wall framing first. We'll come back and then worry about our drywall backing prior to the roof going on. You guys have seen this done in many videos of mine. It's something we do every single time. Now, what do I mean by that? When you frame a wall, you have your bottom plate. Drywall will obviously screw in there. You have your top plate, they can screw in there. They need perimeter nailing or screws similar to roof sheathing. So down the corner and down that corner over there, you have to make sure that you have a stud in place. I'll show you what I mean. Now say we have a sheet running across this way. This stud does not land on 16 center, but it's in place to where you have drywall backing. So the sheet of drywall will run over and they have a nice solid inch and a half to screw into all the way down. This sheet will come over this way. They have this to screw into here. Now every corner on a house that you build needs to look just like that. You need to have a stud coming out both ways to give them backing to screw into this way and that way. So when you go to do all your wall framing, you wanna make sure that wherever you have an intersecting wall at, you have a stud on this side and on this side back here for drywall backing. Now, in order to achieve this and get drywall backing as easy as possible, we build what we call a channel. Now, a channel is three pieces of material. You guys have seen them built in my videos. If by chance you haven't watched a single thing that I've ever put out, please consider clicking the I card. I have tons of different house builds documented on here. A lot of fun. Back to what we were talking about though. A channel is three pieces of material. You'll have a two by six flat, two by six flat, and then a two by six in between. And by building that and putting it in place right here, it allows us to have backing here and on the other side and solid backing for this wall to nail into. Now it doesn't stop there. If you guys can remember to back out the corners of your room, you can remember to back out your ceiling as well. Now there's multiple different ways to achieve backing for your ceiling. The first method and the worst method is nailing a two by six flat on top of the wall. Now the reason I don't like this method is very simple. If you stuck a two by six flat on that wall up there and say the concrete had a quarter inch dip here at the bottom, if you plane from the trusses over into that backing that you just installed flat, what's going to happen is it's gonna come across and then take that quarter inch dive where the dip in the concrete is. So now I'm gonna show you the best possible method for installing backing. Check it out. So in order to get this backing here, it's very simple. Now you can see how we have it set up here. We have a two by four on both sides of the intersecting wall and blocking that runs from truss to truss, keeping these two by four for backing in plane. Now you don't have to have backing along this plate here where the truss lands on the wall. You only need to have backing where you have an intersecting wall and trusses run parallel to it. And the job of that backing is only for edge screws in your drywall. We've gone over the basics. We know what a stud is, a bottom plate, a top plate, Cripples, top and bottom, header, sill, trimmers. You understand how a wall goes together. Another thing I wanted to note real quick is that depending on the size of the opening, especially out here in California, we're known for being over-engineered. The opening size depicts what you have for a header. So while this little 36 inch window behind me may only have a six by six header, if we walk on into the great room, 
I'll show you one that's a little bit bigger. So we can see behind me here that we have a fairly large header. And the reason for that is simple. We're not dealing with a small opening here. We have a 16 foot set of sliders going in here. Therefore, we need this big old beefy header above me. You need something much bigger carrying the weight of that roof above. So when you're dealing with that big of an opening, a six by six will sag. You figure all the way to that roof from above, pushing down on it, it's not gonna end well. So we have a five and a half by 15 PSL running across there. So since a six by six is not adequate enough, the engineer does the job of making sure that all of them have a proper header. And since we're dealing with such a big opening, inch and a half or just a regular old two by six trimmer isn't gonna cut it. So the bigger the opening, the bigger the material. You're gonna be dealing with monster headers. And since you have a very large header up there, you need something pretty big underneath it to carry that load, since that is the job of the trimmer. So as we come over here, you can see that we have a six by six for the trimmer here. And the job of that trimmer is to hold up the header above. Now, as a framer, you don't have any responsibility on determining what is big enough where we simply build the structure. Structural engineers go to college for this type of thing. They learn the load ratings of everything in a building and they can determine what is safe to use where. With that being said, please do not ever take one of my videos and try and swap in some monstrous beam into your house thinking that you can do whatever and anything you want. That's a wrap, guys. I hope you were able to take something away from this video, whether it be something as simple as bottom plates are treated or top plates are used for load-bearing purposes. If you guys enjoy this type of video and wanna know more about rough framing, what goes into it and how it works, please leave a comment down below and let me know. I appreciate all your guys' feedback. And while times are tough right now, and I know coronavirus is taking a lot of people out of work, I hope that all of you guys are safe at home and that everything has been going good. If you enjoyed this video, big thumbs up, subscribe button down below. I'll catch you guys next time. Bang on.